Films, among other things, can give a glimpse into the spirit of the times in which they're made. For example, the original Terminator movie made in the 80s during the Cold War era can be viewed as an example of humanity's uneasy relationship with technology and the potential for doomsday apocalypse. Terminator 2, made in the 1990s during the United States economic boom, can be thought of as a commentary on how this dangerous technology can actually be controlled when accompanied with other technological tools and in the hands of the right people. And the third Terminator movie, made in a post-9-11 world at the beginning of a new era of military invasions in the Middle East, is a commentary on how, no matter what, doomsday is never avoided, only postponed. What's interesting about the films being made nowadays here in a post-COVID world is that some of them are really good examples of what I consider to be called post-postmodernism, which I'll admit is a stupid name. Sometimes it gets called metamodernism, but while it's a stupid name, I do kind of like the name post-postmodernism because it requires us to firstly understand what modernism is and understand then what postmodernism is, and then finally see post-postmodernism as a response to both. In particular, I want to talk about in this video how two films, Blade Runner 2049 and Everything Everywhere All at Once, do all of this and thusly are post-postmodern films. So to get there, I'll first explain what I mean by this modernism thing, then explain what I mean by postmodernism, and then finally get to the culmination of how Blade Runner and Everything Everywhere respond to those isms in a very meta-modern way. So firstly, let's talk about modern films. Modern films and the ideas they represent are pretty common. They typically have a main character that is important in some special way and represents some kind of fundamental truth or virtue or ability. For example, Star Wars, especially the original Lucas films, are classic modern films. They center around a character who is special from birth. Luke Skywalker is one of the last descendants of Jedi and one of the only few left who can bring balance to the Force and defeat a large great evil in the universe. In Star Wars, there are clear roles of evil versus good, light and truth versus darkness and deceit, etc and the protagonist is aligned with the right side, which you are intended to root for. Another example of modernism is the Lord of the Rings trilogies. They center around the character who is, because of his unique resistance to evil, given a quest to travel to a faraway dangerous land to vanquish the great darkness in the world. He is aided by others who either have some lineage of nobility, represent light, wisdom, or virtue, or a pure heart. While some of his closest allies do end up getting corrupted by evil, he endures and completes his quest, upholding the strength of good versus evil. Modernism, in short, loves binaries between two polar entities and sides with one over the other. These are the types of things I'm talking about when I talk about modern films. There are definitive truths and roles, and these roles often deal with clear boundaries between what is good and evil, wrong or right, virtuous or unvirtuous. With modernism explained, we can now talk about postmodernism, which is a response and a critique to the narratives found in modernism. Postmodernism rejects the universal validity of these categorizations of binaries, and their commonplace in films such as good versus evil, and rejects the sort of privilege and importance that main characters are often represented. This can be expressed and shown in a multitude of ways. For example, I'd argue that the Lovecraft universe, along with the movies and games that have been inspired by it, are an example of postmodernism. In the Lovecraft universe, the greater beings or gods that are beyond the universe are so powerful and so otherworldly, and that some of them have no real vested interest in us at all. Humanity and our small place in the universe is an accidental outfall of a larger history one that includes societies of godlike creatures and their slave wars. We as members of humanity might believe ourselves and our kind to be important, but the truth is that compared to these timeless creatures in history, we are unimportant. We may occasionally garner the attention of greater beings, but we are never the center of the universe. Joker is a more recent example of postmodernism. The main character is not, like in modern films, the clear example of a hero or a person you admire or wish to emulate. The main character struggles with his mental illness and the decaying society around him. The political and social leaders, his family, his co-workers, the people who are meant to protect him and bring health and prosperity to the world are deficient in some way. They only appear certain ways to serve their own interests. The outside world eventually dissolves into chaos, and in the end, neither Arthur nor the world gains stability. If anything, there's only an evolution of institutional violence into a manifestation of physical violence. Postmodernism, in a nutshell, responds to the binaries of modernism like good versus evil and shows that such roles and virtues are empty or unrealistic in some kind of way. This brings us, finally, to post-postmodernism, which is the response to both modernism and postmodernism. Metamodernism sees justification in the satire, irony, deconstructivism, and the dance that postmodernism has with nihilism as well-grounded. You ever dance with the devil in the pale moonlight? But they then, after acknowledging postmodern critique as valid, recast the credence, often in a new way, towards the themes and concepts of modernity. Post-postmodernism thusly does not reject binaries like truth versus deceit. 
It doesn't deny that there are important people or things in the world. How those things exist, though, is understood in a completely different way than modern films. But those binaries are still there, and they still play a role in the narrative. That's all pretty abstract, and this video has been probably getting too abstract for its own good, so let's step away from talking about concepts and start looking at these two films, Blade Runner 2049 and Everything Everywhere All at Once. I'll also quickly mention here that because I'm really getting into the weeds of these particular films, there are going to be spoilers ahead, so watch out. Blade Runner 2049 follows the story of Kay, who is a replicant, aka bioengineered humanoid slave laborer who works as a Blade Runner which means he's responsible for tracking down and killing other replicants. While on the job, he unearths the remains of a female replicant who appears to have been able to produce a child biologically, which has been previously thought to be impossible. This ability for replicants to have children is also heavily sought after for the company who manufactures replicants, the Wallace Corporation. As he gathers more evidence about this child whose birth is all intents and purposes a miracle, he realizes that the memories of the child that he's hunting are aligned perfectly with the life of his own having him conclude that he is, in fact, this miracle child. So far, the story of Blade Runner 2049 is in modernist territory. We have all the makings of a Disney fairy tale story. Our protagonist, who everyone thinks of as nothing but labor, suddenly realizes that they are a special prodigy and have an important claim to what fate and destiny have provided. As the story continues, however, we realize that Kay's biggest clue and assumption, the fact that he has real memories as a miracle child, and his conclusion that because he has them that he must be the child, are off the mark. While he does have memories of things that actually happened, they never happened to him. In fact, countless other replicants also have these real memories, and countless other replicants have likewise been led to the false idea that they themselves must be the owners of these memories, and thus be special. This happens in the we all wish it was us scene of the movie, and when it does occur, it brings a huge tonal shift to the film. That is just a piece of the puzzle. You imagined it was you. Oh, you did. You did. We all wish it was us. That's why we believe. What Kay thought was key to his truth was simply a puzzle piece, scattered into the minds of machines in the hopes that the puzzle pieces might come together one day. It's here in the film that we acknowledge and peer down the typical postmodern film take. The ideas that we have aren't special. Nearly all of us wish or have idealized that we were special. We are like a child being born into a world with hope and of importance, only to continue to learn about how the world operates with us in it, to realize we can't live up to the hopes and aspirations of our prior naive self. This isn't where the film ends though, and this is the setup that allows us to respond in a post-postmodern way. While Kay is, in the grand scheme of things, just another cog in the wheel, he decides to make his own decision in the film and takes Deckard, who he was previously tasked of killing, to meet his daughter for the first time in years. Kay ultimately dies at the end of the movie. His memories, his life echoes the words and sentiment expressed in the original Blade Runner's famous Tears in the Rain monologue. That all of his suffering, his pleasures, his hopes, and dreams will be forgotten like tears in the rain. And as he dies, he dies in snowfall which parallels the context of the original speech, but without any extra words or grand speeches, but simply mirrors it, but in a much colder, natural extreme. It may be true that Kay's role in life will be forgotten in Blade Runner's universe and history. If history remembers anyone at all, it will remember the story of Deckard and his family. Kay's role will be a small footnote, a random serial number replicant who happened to be in the right place at the right time for Deckard to continue his journey and his story. What Blade Runner's post-postmodern story shows, though, is that despite all of this, Kay's story is not insignificant. We all play a role, even if it's a small or forgotten one in a larger story. We often don't realize this and often can forget that we are making decisions at all. But even machines in the universe of Blade Runner can make decisions for themselves, even ones that are sacrificial and forgotten. We can't all be main actors and main protagonists in the stage of life. We aren't all special. But what Blade Runner's metamodernism shows is that this doesn't mean that we don't contribute in some way to a larger story or purpose. 
and that our contribution as a forgotten character history can be just as meaningful, just as hopeful, rageful, and beautiful as any other thing in life can be. It thus acknowledges the postmodernism perspective, but responds to that in its own unique way that reaffirms the aspects of modernity's original values. Another film that does something like this is Everything Everywhere All at Once. The film's protagonist is Evelyn, who owns and runs a laundromat with her husband, Wayman. The laundromat business is being audited by the IRS due to Evelyn's not clearly intentional or unintentional false claims on purchases unrelated to the laundromat. To add to Evelyn's struggles, Wayman is preparing to divorce her, and her daughter, Joy, brings her girlfriend to the family gathering, which results in Evelyn feeling compelled to subvert her daughter's queer identity to her demanding and traditional father. Things quickly spiral out of control in a much different way, however, during a trip to an IRS building, when Wayman's body is temporarily taken over by a Wayman of a different universe known as Alpha Wayman. He explains how the multiverse works, how you can do this thing known as verse jumping, which makes it so your mind can travel between universes, but how verse jumping can be dangerous if it is done too much and too recklessly. But on the other hand, how verse jumping can allow you to transfer skills and knowledge gained from one universe into another. Essentially, if you know Kung Fu in one world, you can share that knowledge in another. We also get introduced to Jopu Tupaki, the alpha verse version of Evelyn's daughter Joy, who has been pushed to the extremes of verse jumping so much that she now experiences the entire multiverse all at once. This essentially makes her a god that can manipulate the world around her. She uses this power to create an everything bagel, which threatens to be the most destructive force in the multiverse, and is also hunting down the Evelyn in the multiverse that can rival her own powers. One thing leads to another, and Evelyn begins to eventually master the art of verse jumping, enough so that she's able to rival Jobu Tupaki and faces against her in a battle, only to learn that the reason that she's actually being hunted down for the first place isn't to kill her, but instead, Jobu Tupaki, aka Alpha Joy, hopes that Evelyn can also see what she sees, everything, everywhere, all at once, and can bring some way of coming to terms with it. The Everything Bagel, a manifestation of all the things in the multiverse, isn't some tool that Alpha Joy plans on using to destroy the multiverse. Instead, it's a tool she hopes to use to destroy herself. And she seeks out Evelyn because she hopes that after talking to her, she can see the value of her life, or any life, in the whole picture of the multiverse. She wants this because with her godlike powers of Jopu Tupaki, she sees that all life is so conditional and easily influenced by the vast world of actualized possibilities and chaos that no single life, let alone hers, is really of any significance in the grand scheme of things. Evelyn initially agrees with this view and thinks that there's something nice and comforting about it. If her life really is so insignificant, then she doesn't have to worry about her failures as a wife or a mother or her career. Jopu Tupaki had hoped that Evelyn would see something in the universe that would make her think differently. But instead, after realizing that Evelyn has no such insight or discovery, concludes that the more we learn about the universe, the more we learn how insignificant and stupid and small we all are. With both Evelyn and Joe Putupaki in agreement that there is no new discovery in the universe or the multiverse that could realign or reaffirm the life of a human being, both resign themselves to entering the void created by the everything bagel to potentially end everything. Before going into the bagel, however, Evelyn hears and sees her husband, Wayman, aka Beta Wayman, petition for kindness and empathy. I don't know. The only thing I do know is that we have to be kind. Please, be kind. Especially when we don't know what's going on. Evelyn then uses this philosophy of empathy and communication and her powers to discover the pain in each adversary that she faces, and then heals that pain for the adversary, thusly removing their desire to fight. This new approach eventually leads to Alpha Joy and Evelyn's argument over happiness. In the end, Evelyn embraces Joy and lets her know that she cherishes what moments of happiness that she and Joy share, and for all the other moments, the moments of failure, unhappiness, disappointment, and more, she will embrace those moments with her. Maybe it's like you said. Maybe there is something out there, some new discovery that will make us feel like even small pieces of shit. Something that explains why you still went looking for me through all of this noise. And why, no matter what, I still want to be here with you. I will always, always want to be here with you. This point in the film is notably very post-postmodern. It looks at the postmodern critique of the human experience, 
that in the grand scheme of things, because it is so finite, quick to change, and subject to varied conditions that themselves are so multiplicit and so infinite that it could be akin to chaos, that there is no framework that a human life can be placed into to give significance. A framework, so to speak, needs to be larger than the picture it frames. And if the picture we see is so infinite and our minds so simple and small, what framework could we hope to create? The writers and directors of Everything Everywhere, colloquially known as the Daniels, mentioned in interviews that the biggest inspiration for the film was technology, in particular the internet and how we experience it. Current generations are literally being born and raised in a world that is defined by internet culture, access, and information. There's an increasingly postmodern sense of anxiety that comes about our experience of the world when that happens to us. Whether it's TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, etc., you can quickly find examples of how difficult it is to think of any one moment as having lasting significance. While scrolling through your media feed, you'll get so much information that it's hard to know how to react to it all at once. For example, you'll see a post of a family reuniting with their lost cat. Next to it, someone letting you know of their cancer diagnosis. In one page, you can see stats of inflation, job loss, economic collapse, and ecological crisis next to someone's picture of a high school graduation and their tasty looking breakfast. Keep scrolling and you'll learn about another war, famine that's happening in another part of the world. The postmodern critique can be summed up to saying something like this. While your experience of the world, both its happiness and sadness, can be real, it's all insignificant when you looked at it from the bigger picture. Everything Everywhere All at Once is post-postmodern response to this, and its story is strikingly humanist. In the face of chaos and the void, we have each other. And the empathy of knowing that we all face that same void and the same struggles in the world can bring us together. I love films that can follow this post-postmodern narrative. I love them in part because, as already mentioned, they give a glimpse into the spirit of the times that they're made. Here we are in the early 2020s. It's a time of history where we are simultaneously at an unlimited potential, but also civilization feels like it's about to break. We constantly discover and blow past technological milestones, yet we are ever closer to midnight on the doomsday clock, and the gaps in our moral nature become wider and more apparent. The information age is now the disinformation age. We have so much data and so many perspectives on so many things in our day-to-day -day psyche that we can't tell anymore if we are too intimately attached to the world or if we aren't attached enough. Growing issues of deep fakes in communities endorsing alternate facts only worsen this. So when a movie can acknowledge and navigate that complexity, swim through all the facets of both modern films' binaries, and then critique them and bring them to a deeper and more interesting perspective of the world, I personally find it something to pause and think, Sorry. What did you say? Huh. Isn't that kind of cool?